1 Kings chapter 21, I want to talk about Ahab and Jezebel. We've been, last week we talked about uh, when uh, Elijah spoke with Elisha. And so he said, I had a hard time keeping up with the Elijah's and Elisha's in that message. They are quite similar. But today we're going to go a little bit further ahead and find out what God does with Ahab and with Jezebel, his wife. You remember it was Jezebel that brought in Baal worship into Israel. And Ahab, uh, being the kind of husband he was, allowed it to happen and followed his wife's leading. And sin uh, caused a great deal of sin in Israel. So now we're going to find out how God is going to take care of Ahab, the king, and Jezebel, the queen, his wife. Let's begin by reading in verse 17 of chapter 21. Verse 17, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he has gone down to possess it. <coughs> And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself, to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off, uh, cut off from Ahab him that visiteth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will make thine house uh, like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha the son of Ahijah. For the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made him to sin. So following the appointment of Elisha, which we talked about last week, where he told Elisha that God wanted him to follow Elijah and be there, of course, uh, to take over the ministry. But following the appointment, appointing of uh, Elisha, there was a period of silence uh, concerning Elijah. If you look at uh, Bible geography and custom books, you find that there was some five or six years from the time he talked to Elisha to the time that God gives him the command to go take care of Ahab. There about five or six years passed between, uh, before his ministry came back into the public eye. Now, he wasn't inactive during that period, the Bible says he was very active forming schools. What kind of schools did he form? The school of the prophets. He was training young preachers to do ministry, young prophets in the ministry, some minor level prophets as it were. Prophecy or prophets are those not that are foretelling the future, but they are forthtelling the truth. So these are what we would call preacher boys. Uh, and he was starting these schools and instructing them and teaching them in the Word of God. So Elijah was a spiritual father, and he was a teacher of many of those young servants of God and getting them established and uh, throughout the land. You remember the time that Elijah said, I only, I remain a prophet of the Lord. Well, not only did he find out about Elisha, now he's training more to fill in the gap. So during the same time, there were great wars between Israel and Syria, if you read it. And Ahab took an active part in those wars. And from time to time, these lesser prophets uh, uh, than Elijah appeared briefly on the scene. So these preachers were going around even ministering in Elijah's, uh, in Ahab's life. And then one day, God again uh, roused up Elijah to appear before Ahab and to make an announcement about the monarch's doom. He wanted, he, God wanted Elijah to go tell Ahab he was going to die and why he was going to die. And this was due very uh, to a, a very wicked crime that he had committed. 
What was that crime? Well, let's take a look then at the terrible deed that Elijah and Jezebel were involved in. I want to give you a little bit of background here. In the city of Jezreel, you remember Jezreel where Elijah ran back from the Mount Carmel to get in, you know, ahead of Ahab when he was going to tell his wife Jezebel what had happened on Mount Carmel? Well, uh, as we study, we find here uh, near the very palace of Ahab was a vineyard. And that vineyard was owned by a man whose name is Naboth. We just read about him. Naboth. And the king wanted that vineyard. He wanted it for himself. And he asked Naboth to sell it to him. And Naboth, who was a God-fearing man, stated that he was forbidden by the Lord to sell the vineyard because it had been an inheritance for, from his father. That was the law in that day, God's law. And so he couldn't sell the vineyard, even to the king, because God forbid it. So Ahab acted like a spoiled child. I always, I'm always amazed whenever I read this part of the story. He acted like a spoiled child. He went back to the palace, and then he got into bed, and he turned his face toward the wall, and he wouldn't look at the servants, and he refused to eat, all because he couldn't have what he wanted. And when Jezebel, his wife, learned about his sulking and his childish behavior, she asked him what the cause was, what's the problem, all right? And her cruel but agile mind very soon settled the solution. She came up with what she thought would be the proper solution, and she told her husband to get up, cheer up, take a bath, comb your hair, I got everything taken care of. It's all going to be good. And so she put her plan into motion. What she did was she she, she had letters, uh, forged letters written. She brought in false witnesses to testify against Naboth. And she had a mockery of a trial. Now, what happened from those three things which she did? Well, as we read our story, she had Naboth put to death with the sanction of of law. In other words, she had told lies and, and established uh, a scenario whereby Naboth was put to death. Put to death. And so uh, we see here that apparently, if you read Second Kings chapter 9, it seems like even his sons, Naboth's sons, were also murdered at this time. Though we aren't told the particulars of exactly how they were murdered, we find as we put the pieces together that not only was Naboth misrepresented and killed, but all of his sons. So there's no more house of Naboth. So he had uh, a little time to go to Naboth's vineyard and gloat over his new vineyard that he just got. He had just a little time, and all of a sudden, Elijah stood up in front of him. The preacher showed up at the house. And so as Elijah came in, this faithful, trusted servant of God, we find here that as he was faithful to, 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 to the commitment that God had given him, Elijah wasted no time in presenting himself to the king. He didn't hem and haul. He went straight to the king. Now take a look at verse 20. I want you to look. Ahab's first words when he saw the preacher in blue. Hast thou found me, O my enemy? Hast thou found me? And then I want you to notice what Elijah said in brown. I have found thee because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Have you found me, my enemy? Yeah, I found you because you committed murder and you got God's attention. So Jezebel and Ahab may have thought that they had covered up their crime quite well, but God had seen what they had done. and There's nothing hidden. This is something we all need to remember. There's nothing hidden from God's eyes. And God neither slumbers nor sleeps. All things are open before Him. None of us, some of us may think, well, we got away with, with that. Or we, uh, God didn't see what I just did. But look at what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Nothing escapes God's eyes. He sees it all, dark or light. God, nothing escapes the eyes of God that are everywhere. 
So a day of reckoning is coming. And God's keeping the record of the event. Now let me say this to you. He doesn't keep the books because He forgets what you did. He, he keeps it as evidence to convince uh, anyone who might dispute the truth, God has it written down in the book. Look at what Jeremiah had to say. The prophet Jeremiah said, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? God is talking here. Can you hide anywhere that God doesn't see you? Saith the Lord, Do not I feel heaven and earth? I'm everywhere. Isn't that what Solomon said? Also, Job says the same thing. In Job chapter 34, verse 21 and 22, Job said, for, the, for his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. There's no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. So you can hide nothing from the eyes of God. Isn't that right? You can't hide anything from God's eyes. God always denounces sin. Ahab wasn't long in learning of God's displeasure, God's anger at the terrible deed that he and his wife had, had, had placed on Naboth and his family. And God's warning and denouncing of evil uh, is even true today. It's very clear. It's very definite to those so-called ministers that even minister today who don't preach the gospel, notice what Jeremiah, the weeping preacher, had to say. In Jeremiah chapter 23, beginning in verse 20, The anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath executed, until he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days uh, ye shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, Yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my word, when they should have turned uh, them from their evil ways and from their evil, the evil of their doing, am I God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? saith the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. What he's saying is, even in Jeremiah's day, there were false preachers who were saying, God's okay with it. It's all right. And you got preachers in pulpits today doing exactly the same thing. It don't matter if you sin. It doesn't matter your sexuality. It doesn't matter whether it goes against the word of God or not. And young people today are saying, why should we pay attention to a book that was written thousands of years ago? What's in it for me today? Because preachers are not declaring the whole counsel of God and, and making it up front and certainly real. Still speaking out against these prophets. Notice what Jeremiah went on to say, beginning in verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that beateth the, the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith, these false preachers, God said, I am against them to take and say, God said this, misusing God's word, taking things out of context, or completely if, uh, tearing out pages that might be offensive to people who are living in sin. God said, I am the Lord. Uh, uh, that, uh, and he said, these are things that I have said. So we can all be sure that our sins will find us out. Amen. Our sins will find us out. Let me give you some example. Adam thought he could hide from God, didn't he? And God walked and said, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. But Adam thought he could hide from God. But God knew exactly where Adam was. Cain murdered Abel. But Abel's blood, the Bible says, cried out from the ground before God. Again, couldn't hide. Achan stole the accursed thing. But God found him out. Ahab, who was jointly responsible with his wife Jezebel for the murder of Naboth, couldn't escape the eye of God. God saw what Ahab and Jezebel committed. 
God found him out. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. We're going to talk about more about that in the days ahead. Thought that he could do something behind Elisha's back that would increase his own personal wealth. If you haven't read about Gehazi, you should. He stole something to increase his own wealth, which was not his at all. But God saw his sin and denounced him through the prophet Elisha. Come into the New Testament, Ananiah and Sapphira. You remember the story. Barnabas had uh, sold his property and brought it and gave it to the church to feed those that were without food. And so Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife, thought that they would do the same thing, but they would only give part of it to the church. And they would say, we're just like, uh, we're just like these others. We have given everything we had. Y'all can stand up and applaud for us now. So they stood and they gave it. And Peter looked at him and said, why have you lied against the Holy Spirit? And they dropped dead in church. After the husband came the wife, the wife the same way. For lying to the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it bring revival to most Baptist churches today? If all of a sudden people that came wanting you to believe that they were holy fell dead because they were sinful? I think it might get our attention. But the fact is that here again, God knew what the truth was. So don't think that you can escape divine retribution when you do wrong. When, we, when, when people in this world do what's wrong, God takes note. Ahab sold himself. He sold himself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. And, and he couldn't get away with it. These things that Jezebel uh, caused to happen were not hidden. You remember what Paul said in Romans 6.23? The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. So we find here that the, the people who sell themselves to work evil in the sight of God will be found out. Will be found out. It's true that mercy belongs to God, but may I say this? Mercy has to be applied for. You have to ask God for mercy. Mercy is what you don't get that you do deserve. Grace is what you get that you don't deserve. Mercy is what you don't get that you deserve. So here we see that you have to apply for God's mercy. You have to ask God for His mercy. It's true that it all belongs to God. You cannot earn the mercy of God. Just because of your race, place, face, or grace, you don't get God's mercy because of who you are or what your church membership uh, is all about. You, you, you cannot earn it. There's no means by which you can merit God's grace or God's mercy. The wages of sin is death. God doesn't overlook your sin just because of who you are, who your mama was. Listen, it's only through the gift of God that we can receive eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's not who your parents were that get you into heaven. And it's not what church you were baptized in that gets you into heaven. It's all by the grace of God, God's mercy, that you asked Him for. So let's not think that we have time on our hands. If you're listening to me either on the internet or in the church and you're not saved, you've never asked Christ to be your Savior, don't sit back and say, I'm young yet. I have plenty of time. I've worked in the funeral home business and I've buried tiny babies I've buried one woman who was 104, and I've buried people in between, even teenagers and children. Folks, listen, my point is this. We don't know how long we have here on this earth. So if you're without Christ as your Savior, don't feel like you've got X number of years because you're in your 30s or your 40s. We're not promised another day. On the other hand, if you are saved and you're living with sin in your life, you don't need to, and you, your fellowship is broken with God. You don't need to believe that, that, uh, that time is on your side. You'll get it right when you want to, or you'll give it up when you're ready. No, God is judging you right now. God is holding you accountable, especially as his own child. There is a sin unto death. John wrote about it. Folks, listen, I've buried many 
a deacon, many, a Sunday school teacher, who I believe died too early because they were living in sin and they wouldn't make it right. And God brought them home. God would rather have you in any state than in this, living in the state of sin, destroying the testimony of God in this world. There's a poet who wrote these words. I may not see the rising of the sun. When evening falls, my work all may be done. So today is mine. Tomorrow may not come. Today is mine. Tomorrow may not come. Well, let's get back into our story because I wanted you to have the background of the terrible deed that Ahab and Jezebel committed. Let's take a look then at how God judged this, the judgments of God. They were severe, but God took care of the needed problem. Remember what Ahab and Jezebel had brought into the nation of Israel. Horrific sin. Uh, the bowing to Baal. By the way, in case you're not familiar, Molech and Baal are the same. And Molech, the bull with a belly cut out, is where parents would bring their newborn babies and lay, it in the, lay them in the fire, pass them over the fire in the coals of the bull's belly, killing them to a false god. So it's a horrible, horrible religion. But because Ahab had sold himself to work evil, God said through Elijah that he, would, uh, that he would bring evil on him and on his family and cut off every male child in the household so there'd be no more generations. Concerning Jezebel, notice what God said. God said to Jezebel in verse 23, He said, The dogs shall, shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Keep that prophecy in mind. Ahab postponed his own death, by the way, by partially repenting. He partially repented. Notice verse 27. In verse 27, the Bible says it came to pass that when Ahab heard these words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and, and laid in sackcloth uh, and went softly. In other words, he walked very quietly, didn't make a big deal about any of it. So he put on sackcloth and ashes a partial repentance. Ahab's death was nonetheless a violent death, and we're going to look at it in just a minute. Some three years later, after this prophecy, three years passed, and, and Ahab would be wounded in battle, and he died as a result of that wound. Let's read about it in verse 29. Uh, before I get to the battle, though, look at what he said in verse 29. Seest thou how Ahab uh, humbleth himself before me? Because he hath humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in, this, in his days. But in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So Ahab's death would come. It would still be a violent death. Three years later, he was wounded in battle. Look at verse 34. Let's read about it. This is the record of Ahab's death. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of the chariot, Turn thy hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up or set up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. And the blood ran out of the womb in the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, Every man to his city, and every man to his own country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria. And they buried the king in Samaria. And, and one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor uh, according unto the word of the Lord, which he spake. That's exactly what God said would happen. And that's exactly what God said to Jezebel happened. It was several years later when divine retribution fell on the head of Jezebel. It took place when Jehu, you remember, the old, you ever heard the saying, he driveth like Jehu? Jehu comes 
just barreling up to the gates of Jezreel. And there was Jezebel and, uh, several years later. And it took place when Jehu came to Jezreel. Now apparently Jezebel thought that her beauty was sufficient to beguile Jehu. And so if she was pretty enough, he wouldn't dare have her killed. Take a look at verse 30. When Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And notice what she did. She painted her face. And I like this, and tired her head. It means adorned her head. She adorned her head and looked out of a, out of, uh, out a window. In other words, she gussied up. And she looked out the window where Jehu, the preacher man, coming down there at a full gallop, would see her, and she figured her beauty would save her from anything the preacher might say. Well, he wouldn't listen to her, though. And he had some of her eunuchs throw her down out the window. He looked up and he said, throw her down. And they flung, they flung her down. They flung her down. Look at verse 33. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trod her underfoot. So after he had, uh, had, um, uh, after he had uh, eaten the thought, uh, eaten, uh, the thought occurred to him that maybe he was a little harsh on the queen. He was disrespectful. So he went back to take and to bury her body. And the Bible says when he got back, all he found was what? Her skull, her feet, and the palms of her hands. You see, when her servants brought him word, we look in verse 36, and it says very simply, Wherefore they came again and told him and said, This is the word of the Lord. This is what God had already so prophesied. This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by who? The servant Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel so that they shall not say, this is Jezebel. You couldn't tell who it was. This is what Elijah had prophesied years before. This was a fearful judgment, folks. But she was an unrepentant rebel against God. She brought in false religion. She led the children of Israel against God. She led her husband into vile worship of Baal. And so she was a, she was a vile sinner who would not repent even when she knew what happened on Mount Carmel. She introduced Baal worship. She knew all the miracles that Elijah had performed, uh, and she reaped exactly what she had sown. I turn over to chapter 10 for just a minute. In, in, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 10, and I want to read for you verse 7 through 11. This is what happened then. We know what happened to Ahab. We know what happened to Jezebel. What happened to Ahab's family according to the prophecy and the fulfillment of the prophecy? Well, take a look then at verse 7. It came to pass when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slew 70 persons and put their heads in baskets and sent them to Jezreel. And there came a messenger and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, Lay ye them in two heaps in the entering end of the gate until morning. And it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, Ye be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. But who slew all these? Know uh, now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So Jehu slew all the remain of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, and all his great men, and his kinfolks, and his priests, until he left him none remaining. So just uh, before Jezebel, Jehu had, uh, had put her to death. Joram, Ahab's son, who was uh, king of Israel. Joram had been wounded in battle with the Syrians and was 
laid up recuperating. And we find in, in chapter 9 and verse 22 that Jehu came before Joram and Joram's first words to him were what? Is it peace, Jehu? Is everything okay? And notice what Jehu said. He said, what peace? What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are still many as long as the job is not finished. And at that, Jehoram fled, ran away. But Jehu drew his bow. And in chapter 9, beginning in verse 24, we read what happened. Jehu drew a bow, and with his full strength, and smote Jehoram between his shoulders. And the arrow went out uh, at, at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. Then said Jehu to Bipkar and the captain, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field, Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I uh, and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth. Remember that's the one that owned the field. I've seen the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. Remember his sons were killed. And the Lord, and I will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground, according to the word of the Lord. So, Jehor, so Joram, the son of Ahab, not only met with a violent death, but he was buried in the very field that Jezebel had Naboth killed to, to own. And the very field that that. Uh, that uh, Ahab wanted so bad that he was willing to go along with the murder conspiracy. God's judgments are sure. God never forgets. It's only by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only by the blood of the Lord uh, spilled on the cross that we can be justified just as if we had never sinned. We can be made righteous before God. We are all trophies of the grace of God. Amen? Amen? If we're not saved, if you've never accepted the blood of Christ as your payment of sin, you'll spend an eternity in hell paying for the sins that you commit. But you can receive Christ as your Savior today. And that payment will be enough. Shall we stand? Next week we're going to pick up here with Elijah's last task. His last task. Starting next week. Father, I thank you, Lord.